ones who survived the war libera liberation did not survive it because we did not want to die, because God decided to save us for another function we did not Michael McQuailweth was born in 1947 in Bor in Jonglei State, eastern part of the then Sudan. <laughs> He started his school in 1954 in Jonglei Elementary School. The school was at that time located in Malakal, Upper Nile State. But in 1955, war broke out in Torit. Consequently, all schools in the then southern Sudan were closed, so Michael McWay only resumed his education a year later. In 1958, I was transferred to Maban elementary school where I went to fourth year in my Mabana elementary school set for the, the primary or elementary schools examination and I was uh, admitted in rank intermediate school uh, in 1960 in 1963, Bor Intermediate School, which was operating in Malakal, was transferred to Jongle State. Michael then moved to Bor. I joined uh, Bor Intermediate School in the third year. Then I went to the fourth year in 1964. And in 1964, war broke out and the schools were closed in, uh, in most parts of, of by then, uh, so southern Sudan. And um, from there I went to the cattle camp when I stayed there, 1965. In early 1966 we were called, so I, we, we went back to school. The schools were not open in the south, but we were transferred to the north. So I went to Managil Intermediate School. Inspired by Abel Alier and the late Martin Majer, who were lawyers, Michael McQuay went to Khartoum University. Continued with my studies in the, in the University of Khartoum Faculty of Law and graduated in 1975. Instead of us graduating in, uh, in March, we graduated in August because we had gone on a strike. The university was closed. So we were called back in June, made to sit in July, and graduated in August. By then people had already sat for the bar, so we had to wait for another one year. So instead of just sitting idly, I decided to, to join the teaching profession. I went to Malakal, and I was a teacher of uh, uh, English language and, uh, and history. In what, uh, what was called Malakal Shabia Secondary School. After that I decided to join the, 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 the High Executive Council which was by then under uh, His Excellency Abel Alier who was the President of the High Executive Council. And in the High Executive Council I, we, I was uh, I had the honor of being one of the founders of the, of the Department of Legal Affairs in the High Executive Council. This Department of Legal Affairs was later upgraded to a Ministry of Legal Affairs under the High Executive Council. And, uh, and from there I continued to progress until uh, by, and, uh, by then in the Ministry of Legal Affairs there was uh, the rules and regulation do say that uh, if uh, in case of a scholarship he who comes first first served i was the first to join the ministry of legal affairs so i was the next man to the director to the uh, to the under secretary of the ministry and uh, even though i was by then a young graduate in great in, uh, we did not have these grades, but we had scales. 
So I was uh, absorbing in scale Q. So one time came for the scholarships. The, the undersecretary by then uh, said, Michael, you, you will not take this opportunity. We'll give it to another person. So that, uh, because I want you to help me in the establishment of the ministry. I said, okay, I'm ready to help, but what next? You are now sending my subordinate. If he goes there, he will go and study, come back later, will be highly qualified, better than me. And uh, definitely he will be my boss. What, uh, what am I sacrificing for? He said, well, we will see if there is any other opportunity we will send you. I said, no, that is not the case. I must go for further studies as long as it is my opportunity. This was not possible. So he refused and he sent my colleague to for studies. And my, my colleague happened to be Dr. Richard K. Mola, <laughs> who is now a PhD holder. Okay. Yes. I, what I know about Makwe, Makwe is uh, very frank individuals uh, and is uh, someone who has uh, a complete dictate uh, he dictate his life or his when he does things he does them with a complete uh, uh, spirit After disagreeing with his boss at the Department of Legal Affairs, Michael McQuay left. He went and joined the Sudan's judiciary. In the judiciary, Michael McQuay worked in Juba, Yei and Meridi. I was uh, promoted to, to B, scale B. And uh, by then I was uh, a first class magistrate. Uh, that is, that was scale B is e equal in the status to a first class magistrate in the judiciary. So when the judiciary opened up applications, I applied. And I was taken as the first class magistrate in the judiciary of, of the Sudan. And after being appointed as the first class magistrate, I was brought I was appointed, transferred to South Sudan, and uh, here in Juba we were the first people to sit in that court, which is now. In 1983, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army was formed. Many Southern Sudanese people were joining the movement, but Michael McQuay continued with his work at the judiciary. From Maridi, I was transferred to Khartoum. Because uh, by then I had started some of these uh, activities of the liberation, so I was uh, my, myself and uh, and uh, Honorable uh, Subek, who is a, a pharmacist, who was a pharmacist in in, um, in Ye, we had started activities to do with the with the rebellion, with the liberation movement. So the security organs started to write a lot of controversial, but there was no re a daily report that did not contain my name. And this had been going to Khartoum. So the Chief Justice in Khartoum decided to transfer me by telegraph. By then we did not have phones. So you were, uh, were, they were using telegraphs. I was assigned to one of the courts which deals with the land issues. And uh, when I was transferred, I was uh, assigned execution of decisions of the court, ten fizat. So, of course, in the ten fizat, there is no much that you do. You just call the parties. When the party doesn't appear, you just call off the meeting, fix another date, and the process continues. So I would go every morning, go and see my cases, and then go away. From then, I started processing my return to join the liberation movement. I requested permission to come and take my family. And I uh, was uh, given 
permission and lot of tickets for family members. I remember I brought about 13 tickets plus mine 14 for members of my family so that I come and take them from here. Well, of course, when I left from here, all the security organs knew that I was no longer coming back. So when I arrived at the airport, I found all the security, those of the national security, especially. Not the current national security, but the national security of, of Nimeri. All of them, they knew me. There was a time they attempted to arrest me here, but they failed. So when I put my arrival at the airport, oh, Molana, welcome back. When you go, why are you back? I said, yes, I'm already back, and I'm now found. I'm very comfortable there. I'm, I found you know, good accommodation for my family, and I've now come to collect them. They said, oh, okay, okay, very good. And, by, and from the airport, I took a taxi to the office of Sudan Airways to go and book my going back to, to, to Khartoum. So I went there, went to the Sudan Airways where I found also some of these security persons there. I went and booked for, I gave myself only four days. Could told the manager that I have just arrived. Oh, whatever, and they knew me all. So I said, I have just arrived now. I'm given only seven days to go uh, to go to report back to my work. So please book me as soon as possible. So I was booked, and um, then I went. I came and put up in the. I came and put up in the in the judiciary mess. And I went to, by then this was the time when Kokora had already started. So I went to Upper Nile office. The person who was in Upper Nile office was Dr. Agri Ayuen, the veterinary doctor. Uh, I, upon my arrival, I just found cars loaded with equipment for Upper Nile going to Jongule. And from there they would proceed. So he said, since you have come, well, take this car. So. I took the car. We proceed. We left here late. We slept on the way. We arrived in the morning. After arrival in the morning, I, um, I, uh, my family was already in the village. So I, I went in the morning and went to the, to the, um, to the, to the executive officer and I reported to him that I have just come, I need a car to take me to go and, go and bring my family from home. Because I did not want this to come to the attention of uh, the national security in, the, in, the, in, in, in Boer town. So he said, okay, very good, since you have come, uh, he gave me a car. So I went home and he said, you go, the car will go and wait for you and you come back. I said, okay, I will do that. So we went. By then, of course, when you are going out from board, you are searched. But I had the privilege of being a judge. I had my ID card. So we, when we arrived at the checkpoint, going out from board town, we came and uh, the soldiers, of course, were in full charge of the whole thing. So they came and started. I said, I'm Judge Michael Mopin. We took the path took the document, look at it, he said, okay, for the theater, for the, we are sorry. When Michael McQuay reached his village, he sent the driver of the government car that had taken him to the village back to Bor. He went on to join the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army. I just coincided with the arrival of, by then uh, some, about a platoon or two platoons from, uh, from Tiger and Timsa and Jamus had already arrived in Bor area. But upon my arrival, the Koryom started to arrive. The whole Boer town joined the liberation movement. 
it was only the army which was left there. All the other regular forces, plus the administration, everybody, people left the town. So we continued to stay. Then uh, Arok Ton Arok arrived, he was the commander of the forces of Koryom. Arok is also, was also my colleague. And he appointed me as a judge to try cases in the liberated areas. So I continued to try cases. We continued up to 1985. And after 85, we decided to go to walk it to Bilfa. We, we went up to a place called Unroar. And there at Unroar, what do you call it, the, the Nyagat, we used to call them the Nyagat, but these are, re, these are militias of the, of the government. They used to intercept people on the way. So we went and stayed in Uror for almost three months. And after three months, a report was brought to us that you are being attacked tonight. And we did not have any, we had about, about 50 rifles only. And the, the, the number of recruits were over 3,000. So the, the, those who were escorting us said, in this situation, we will not be in a position to protect you. So let us withdraw. So we, we withdrew. We came back up, up to Duke. And thereafter, we started moving again. Now Arab decided to move with us. So we went back. We proceeded up to, up to Tirgul, where we crossed River Akoba. We went to Tirgul. We went to Itang, and from Itang we went by land, we drove by land up to Bonga, the tr to the training center, where we met uh, late Dr. John and his members of the high command. Uh, the current president, Salva Kiir, was, was there. Um, Salva Kiir was there, Carbino was there, Arokton, who was a member, he joined his colleagues. And uh, after that, we were brought back to, to Itang, refugees camp where we came and registered as refugees. Then we, we were organized, we went to... Uh, in Itang, there is a, where there is a camp set up, set outside. We joined that uh, camp where you get some rehearsals as an in introductory training for... Uh, int introductory training for the would-be military training. We continued there. And, um, and from then we were uh, taken to, to the political school. We went to the political school in, uh, in uh, Zinc, in Ethiopia, near Gambela. Uh, we, got, we, we were from there taken to Bell Farm where we were commissioned as political commissars, political officers in other words. I was commissioned as a first lieutenant because uh, there was an st outstanding decision that uh, any graduate is commissioned as a first lieutenant with two stars. Uh, any medical doctor, medical doctor, if graduated, is, is made to be a captain. Any PhD holder, if he is trained, he is graduated as a captain. So for I was uh, graduated as a first lieutenant and a political commissar as well. And uh, from then we went to the Bonga Training Center where we went for military training. We went to Shield 4 and in Shield 4 we had uh, three months intensive training. And after training we were graduated and uh, all, all those who were not commissioned were commissioned. But those of us who were commissioned, we were just uh, made to, you we were graduated in your rank and then deployed. Michael McCoy was then deployed to the northern sector. Michael says service in the army was successful because of, among other things, luck. So the first deployment we had was uh, we were brought, I, I was brought to Fachala. 
And in Fashala, this was actually a centre where all the officers were brought in, and then, and then from there they would be deployed to the various battalions. So I was uh, when we were in Fashala, we were then did be deployed to Joko. The first operation we attended was in Joko. I was in the headquarters of William Nguyen, and uh, we. Uh, we managed to capture Joko. And uh, thereafter, after the capture of Joko, I was deployed to Itang as the resident major, as a judge. It was called, uh, we were called judge advocates. So we, I went to Itang to be part of the administration of Itang. Of course, in any place where there is a group of people, there must be cases, there must be crimes. So I continued to, to try the cases, being criminal or civil. When I was deployed to, 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 to the northern sector, which was Maban, we went to Maban. We were being commanded by Lama Kol and late uh, Martin Maniel. And uh, those of Nyal Deng Nyal, we were there with them. I was then a, left a lieutenant. Nyal was a captain. I was his first lieutenant. And uh, we continued in the operations of Maban. But that time we failed to capture Maban and instead the the, the, the government forces were very hostile on us and we had to withdraw from the operations. And we came and uh, stayed in a place called uh, Lol. This is where we came and settled and we continued to make uh, operations, ambushes and so forth. We continued and uh, up to up to 1991. An army is based on discipline. Discipline is, 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 is like, you know, a backbone in the army. So the discipline must be imposed by all means. Uh, so if, if soldiers, you know, go against the law, because we have a law for the army, there are many ways of trying to get them back to the right track. They can be uh, cautioned, they can be warned, they can be disciplined uh, orally, you know. But if the violation is extreme, then they, they need to be court martialed or taken to court. So that is the work of the judicial officers in, in army units. And that is the work uh, Captain Michael McQuay was doing when he was under my command. As a lawyer, of course, he did his job well. Uh, nothing uh, I can say that he, he failed to do. He did his job well, and of course, as zonal commander, I'm the one who at the end will look at the sentence he has passed. I remember one of the one of the situations where we uh, we were under attack. The, the government of Sudan had moved out in a big force, moving towards our direction, passing through us and going to to Pagak, the current Pagak, this was the time when we had just established Pagak. And I was one of those who established Pagak was a forest. We came and cut the trees and started building our tukuls there and there. So the, 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 the convoy which was coming was going up to Itang with the mission of going to destroy Itang and withdraw. Itang is in refugees camp in Ethiopia. But the Sudan government knows that Itang is one of the sources of supply to the, to the rebellion. So they decided to move, to go and destroy that. 
So every time, and now by then our forces had just reduced, they became very flimsy. So every time uh, Lama called, we send a message to, to Dr. John, and Dr. John would respond, we will send you the reinforcement. That process continued. And unfortunately that year also the rains delay. Because if it, were, if it had rained, then definitely the cars would got stuck and uh, they will not be coming. They only come for operations during the dry season. Now the rains delay up to May. And we were under the threat of being overrun. And uh, the forces started to move. They cross Yabus, which is the stream that, that uh, passes around Maban. And they started moving towards us. Now Lama called, sent a message again to let Dr. John and told him that now we may be forced to pack and go. So he responded and said, no, don't move. We are sending you the rain battalion. We are reinforcing you with the rain battalion. <laughs> and uh, on receiving the, the message, Lam called me and said, you see, your brother, is he mad really? Is he not mad? How can he send us a rain battalion? Is he a rainmaker? <laughs> so, that's why we just laughed it out. Imagine when the forces moved from there, they came and spent the night on the way. That same night, a very heavy rain fell. Very heavy. And the soil there is also that type of soil which, once it rains, it becomes very muddy and very soft. So, Whenever there is water, the car just goes down deep. So it rained throughout the night. And we had a force, a small, uh, we had about two, 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 two squads, which we had put there with, uh, with uh, RU22K, a uh, telephone, a mobile. Uh, to keep us in contact, to keep us informed about what is happening. When it rained, all the cars and all the Dababad got stuck completely. They could not move. In the morning, they waited. When the rain stopped, they started working on these cars. They would pull one car, pull it, pull it, until they take it to a high ground. Then they continue with the other. They continue with the other. They worked there for two days. Now when they came out, they just decided to return. Because they said, if it rains again, it means that we'll get completely isolated. And we may, they may be annihilated by the, by the rebels. So they decided to go back to Maban. <coughs> Upon the receipt of the night, we celebrated. <laughs> The year 1991 brought with it one of the biggest tests of times on the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army. Riyag Machar was in, uh, in uh, Malut area. By then, uh, those of uh, there had been an ongoing coordination and planning between Lamakol and Riyag Machar. Riyag Machar would send his uh, security officer every week to come to to, to, to Lama call. And then they would come after eating our supper. Lam will, will fall into his tukul. He would put on his uh, solar lamp. And they sit to talk with this security officer throughout the night. And then in the morning, the security officer would go after, after breakfast, the security officer would leave going back to the Machar. 
So we began to be suspicious. What is this? We tried to follow up. And the cause of follow, of the follow up, uh, Lama Kual decided to arrest those whom he suspects to be following him up, following up <laughs> closely. <laughs> so we continued. Uh, these reports have been going to, to the late Dr. John, I remember, but uh, Dr. John had not been coming forth. But in, at that particular moment, of course, as stated, uh, Riek was coordinating with Lam on the Ingla of the 1991. Uh, from then, we moved out from the, the Ethiopian government, the Ethiopian Magisto fell. Of course, the system of Magisto was the one supporting us. So when the, the current URPDF, ERPDF, when they took over, we, we were under threat. So Victor John directed that we move out from Ethiopia. So we came via, we left out from, we came from, from, from Aban, we came to Itang. While in Itang, the, the government of Magiso collapsed. We could not go back to Maban. So from there we departed. Lem decided to go to, because people were already conscious of the plans of Riyang Machar and Lem. So those of us who knew and everything decided not to go with him again, not to go to Nasser. Lem was saying, let us all, all go to Nasser. We said no. Some of us decided not to go to Nasser, but to go to Penyudu and from Penyudu to Fashala. We came to Fashala. Then from Fashala, all the forces moved. And uh, again, I was, uh, it was President, uh, President Salfakir who was moving with us by then. So he came and uh, appointed a force to remain with the, with the refugees, with the displaced. Now they are, they were no longer refugees, but displaced because they have come back to South Sudan. We were in Fachala. So a force was appointed and an administration was appointed. I was again appointed as a judge to look into the cases of these people in Fachala. In 1993, the Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army and the displaced people were to come under severe attacks from the Khartoum government. The Ethiopian government was hostile. They coordinated with the Sudan government and they attacked us through Ethiopia in Pachala and they managed to dislodge us and capture Pachala. So people moved. It was another exodus. People moved, some went to Pibor, others went to Pakok and from Pakok to Boma. Those who went from Pakok to Boma are the ones that went up to, went up to Kapoeta and from Kapoeta they went to Narus. And at Narus, when Narus, when the, the Jalaba also followed and captured Kapoeta, those who were in Narus, especially the Red Army, were moved immediately to 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 to, to, to Lokochokyo and from Lokochokyo to Kakuma. This was now the beginning of the establishment of Kakuma refugee scam. Kakuma refugee scam was established and then people started to go there. And it continued up to this moment. It was from there that the, some of the lucky Jesh Ahmed were taken as uh, un unaccompanied minors. They were taken to the first world, especially to America, to Canada and Australia, where they went and studied. And some of them now have graduated, they are PhD holders, they are specialists and so forth. These were part of the Red Army there. Michael McQuay and other Sudan People's Liberation Movement and Army members moved to Boma 
where he says some of his most painful memories of the years of liberation war lies.